welcome to the components of internet of things course so in the last one hour we have looked into the basics of deep learning and what do we mean by statistical learning so when we have a huge chunk of data and we want to fit a model what are the possible means one can go for the machine learning technique one can go for the deep learning technique to fit the best model for their own purpose so now we are now we are going to look into more into the neural network which is sometimes called the artificial neural network as well so the concept of neural network existed since long ago it has different names and different time point like in early 40s and 50s it was named as cybernetics then it became popular once again in 80s and people used to call it is the connectionism or the neural net and then the popularity goes down a little bit after 90s and again it become popular in 2006 onwards so the main reason of popularity we have seen a little bit of the stuff earlier because of the reason that we have a huge amount of data now which we can store very easily cost effectively and moreover we have a very high computation power compared to 80s so therefore if it's a complex problem still we can solve that problem uh, to a great uh, with a great accuracy so that uh, that created a huge buzz in the community and uh, people are using deep learning framework in their problem solving mechanism so let us look into the basic model that we that was developed in some around 1960s so which is called the perceptron so that is the most fundamental concept for a neural network so if you look into the diagram below here then uh, the basic understanding is this that i have a set of inputs x1 x2 and some bias so bias will bias we need to determine but for the time being let us assume that we have these two inputs x1 and x2 <coughs> we will perform uh, uh, linear combinations of these two input variables <coughs> with some weight w1 w2 and there may be some bias most of the time it will be present and once we do a linear combinations of those inputs then we pass through a threshold mechanism or i sh we should have a threshold block that will say either it's 0 or 1 so if this summation is above a certain threshold then i will call my output is 1 and if it's below that threshold then i will call my output is 0 uh, so which we can actually uh, write in a more mathematical manner with a mathematical expression something like this so we take the input uh, wi and all the inputs uh, addition with the bias i will sum over all of this and then i will take the sign so if it's positive or zero then i will say my output is one or if it's uh, less than zero then i will call this is zero so this is a basic linear classifier so if if i so i will find out linear combination based on which uh, i will apply a threshold link on that output and finally we will determine whether uh, it's 0 or 1 <coughs> so so when we try to solve any kind of classification problem then the issue is that we have to identify the appropriate feature of that problem so if we have identified the feature and if we can determine the correct way or the most appropriate way then we can easily find out the appropriate class for the given inputs so so identifying these features is 
difficult that we have seen in the context of machine learning. Now, <coughs> coming to uh, an extended version of the model, so, uh, so, so if you look into here, so typically the perceptron will be called as this block. So, I have a linear combinations of the inputs followed by some nonlinear function. <coughs> Maybe it's a thresholding or maybe some other nonlinear function. We will see in details what are what could be those function. So now if I replace this block with a single uh, circle like this, then we have a set of inputs for a given problem. We can have multiple number of perceptron. We can uh, so this multiple number of perceptron we have some bias and <coughs> once we pass through this block we are go going to determine the final output so in this output there can be a linear combination of the inputs followed by some thresholding function and then we will get the output so basic idea is that it will be some linear combination followed by some nonlinear function <coughs> So there can be multiple such stuff in between. It's not necessary that there will be only one layer of neurons here and there can be multiple number of neurons in each level. So let us take a simple example how we can actually determine this W value. So let's take a very simple scenario when we have an AND gate that we want to uh, we want to develop a neural network model for this AND gate. So the Boolean functionality or the truth table for AND gate is well known. So the value will be zero when any one of the input x1, x2 is zero, and it will be one when <coughs> uh, both of them are actually one, which has been denoted through this green dot. So, <coughs> so, so that is the actual objective. Now, so in this network, what we need to do is that this will be my input. So, somebody has to provide me this 0, 1 combination and I need to determine the value of W2, I need to determine the value of W1 and the value of bias. So, if we can determine these three, then, then given any inputs we will be able to tell that what, what could be the output. So let us take an example, let us let us decide for the time being that B is minus 1.5 and W1 and W2 to be 1 for the time being. So now if somebody provides me an input say x1 equal to 0 and x2 equal to 1 then what we are getting is so we will do a linear combination of these three values with the appropriate weight. So effectively we will get the value of uh, minus 0.5 at this place and so when we apply a thresholding, let us say it is uh, based on the sign, then we will say that my output will be 0. <coughs> so effectively what we are doing here, we are basically <coughs> uh, uh, classifying this input whether this input 0 1 or 1 0 or 0 0 falls into the 0 category or when it is 1 1 it falls into the 1 category. So if you try with the other values you will be able to observe that it actually realize the AND gate. So what it effectively means that by choosing this value minus 1.5 and this one and this one, it effectively basically uh, it effectively demarcates these planes into two parts. In one of the plane, these uh, blue dots will be there, and the other plane, this green dot will be there. So effectively, what it does, it basically separates the two uh, uh, two sets of points through a straight line. 
and this is not very hard to determine the actual um, straight line equation so since we know that just w1 w2 these two are the inputs and i know the bias so i can actually figure uh, the equation of the straight line <coughs> so this is an example in which we can uh, have a single neuron to classify the set of points so if you look into some other examples like uh, if we have an or gate or if we have a different version of the and gate with a different stuff then still we'll be able to classify with a single neuron so effectively what does a neuron do it linearly classify into two groups and for these examples these are actually linearly classifiable so we can solve this problem using a single neuron now let us look into the example of an XOR gate so XOR gate the truth table that we know that it will be one when when exactly one of them is one and it, it will be zero when both of them are zero or both of them are one so now if we want to we want to classify this set of points through a single neuron we won't be able to do so because by a single straight line we cannot demarcate these four points so therefore we have to go for a <coughs> uh, higher order problem or we have to we have to have a nonlinear partition of this set of points something like this or we can have a linear, uh, linearly separated stuff but not with a single line but with multiple lines so so effectively uh, uh, the, even if the neuron does a lin uh, linear classification but not all in or uh, not all problems will be able to use a single neuron to classify the stuff in a in a linear manner so in order to classify the set of points we need to have multiple neurons so either my neurons can have a higher higher order degree <coughs> or i can have multiple uh, uh, linear classifier that will be combined together to realize this kind of environment <coughs> so 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 that the stuff that we have talked about till now is that um, there are issues with linear separation because we cannot have a single line for this XOR gate but still i can solve this problem using a single neuron or if i can represent my data this input data in a different manner so here this is an example that we have translated the input space into a different domain so instead of representing it as an x2 we represent this input as and of x1 and not x2 and the other axis in this way so if we if we represent the set of inputs in this manner then i can easily classify this xor function with a single straight line so the important thing to note here is that how are we representing my data that is very very crucial if you can represent my input data in a proper manner in a more structured manner then i can have a single linear classifier to separate out the two objects but if we cannot uh, have if we cannot represent my data in in a proper manner then we need to have multiple such neurons so, and when we solve this problem with deep learning the objective of or the philosophy of this strategy is that it will start learning this kind of high level feature from the given input because when we need to classify my uh, this set of points at the last level I should be able to say it's 1 or 0 so when I try to say it's 1 or 0 I should have a uh, situation something like this that 
the set, set of points will be uh, divided into two groups and my system is expected to learn that high level feature which is not easily uh, identifiable from the given input so we'll see more on that stuff in few minutes so in a more generic sense <coughs> this artificial neuron is represented in this manner <coughs> so we have the set of inputs uh, this x1 to xk this is bias and uh, uh, this is the actual neuron so what is here so it has a linear combinations of the inputs along with a bias so we call this as pre activation function so we just simply do a linear combination of this x1 multiplied with the appropriate weight so wi xi plus b the bias and if we try represent in a vector notation then we use w transpose so once we have this pre activation function then we actually apply an activation function which is in general nonlinear in nature <coughs> so we apply this g function on the ax that is the pre activation function or the linear combination of the inputs and we get the actual hx so the final output that we get is the our hx so for the given input what is the final output and if we expand it then we can rewrite in this manner so typically it will be denoted w as the weight vector b as the bias for my neuron and g will be used to denote my activation function so now let us see what what are the sum of this activation function so the very simple activation function is the linear activation function so whatever input i am getting i am actually saying that is the output so it's not very interesting so no change in value and uh, the range of this x can lie between minus infinity to plus infinity so it can be an activation function but it's not that much interesting not that very useful the other function that are used as an activation one is the sigmoid function that we have seen when we talked about the logistic regression in the last lecture so what does sigmoid function do so it maps the input into a probability or i can say that it maps the input into a value between 0 to 1 so this expression so so the expression for the sigmoid function is something like this and if we plot we will get a curve something like this so <coughs> when x is minus infinity the value is almost 0 and when it's plus infinity the value is close to 1 the interesting fact about this function is that it's actually differentiable in the whole range and it's strictly increasing function as well as it's a bounded one because its value cannot go beyond 0 and 1 on either side <coughs> so so there are another function known as hyperbolic tangent function which is similar to sigmoid function but the difference is that instead of making or uh, instead of mapping the input between 0 and 1 it maps the value between minus 1 to plus 1 again it's a strictly increasing function the value can be positive or negative and it's also bounded <coughs> so there are certain advantage and disadvantages of these functions and uh, these are kind of active research so you have to one have one has to choose the appropriate activation function depending on the problem so the other most or the most popular activation function nowadays is the ReLU or the 
rectified linear unit <coughs> so what does it says it's this function is similar to the linear function that means whatever input is provided it will say the same thing as output only in one half of the zone and on the negative half of the zone it will say the value is zero so it's a increasing function <coughs> and it's not a bounded one on the uh, upper side so the value can goes from zero to infinity so, and this can be defined in this manner so it's max of zero and x so one thing to note in this set of function that when we have any kind of activation function we need to consider the derivative of the function at the different values because the derivative of the function will be used to modify the weight parameters that we need to determine the w parameters so if my derivative is zero then i won't be able to make any modification on the weight and if i have a high gradient or the high derivative i'll be able to modify my gradient in a proper manner so so why that gradient is important that we, it, that will be clear in a moment so so in in terms of that derivative so it's uh, no it's non zero on this sub plane so even if it goes very high still the derivative is non zero so 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 the thing that we have talked about for a generic uh, multi layer neural network it will look something like this that i have the set of inputs <coughs> on this layer followed by a set of hidden layers these are h basically denotes the set of hidden layers followed by final output layer and in every layer we will have some bias input and we can define this stuff in a mathematical manner uh, in this way so i will have the activation function in each layer <coughs> and then the pre, sorry this is the pre activation functions in each layer then we apply the activation function we get the h which acts as the input for the next layer and in the final layer we will have uh, an output function so when we have this multi layer neural network or of a set of neurons in uh, available in a single layer what does it physically mean is that if i assume that my uh, my neuron demarcates the plane into two halves then this neuron may be probably representing this partition of the space and this neuron may be denoting the partition of this space now when we are combining these two neuron together maybe we will get a more com complex curve uh, something like this so effectively <coughs> it basically uh, finds out a region in which a particular value will be true and we have several such neurons and we can actually uh, find out or we can actually uh, we can find out the region in which certain things is true and we can construct any arbitrary space uh, demarcation in this 3d space space 3d space or any higher order space <coughs> so so the one of the most important concept is the capacity of the neural network so if i have a single neuron i can demarcate the space into only two halves if i have more than one neuron so i can demarcate the space in in a very complex zone as well now there is a important theorem to know which is called as universal approximation theorem <coughs> the idea is very interesting 
so what does it say that a single hidden layer neural network with with a linear output unit can approximate any continuous function arbitrarily well given enough hidden units so if i had enough number of hidden units in a single layer then i can actually um, map any function arbitrarily well <coughs> so this is an important theorem that so what effectively it means that <coughs> i can uh, i can map to any function so if 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 a function is given which uh, which is denoted by a complex region on a given space still i'll be able to uh, represent that stuff using enough number of neurons but the issue with this um, uh, theorem or not the issue but the this theorem does not tell about that how to uh, find the necessary number of parameters so <coughs> so how many number of neurons that i need and uh, how i can determine those w parameters from this uh, from this network and another interesting thing is that though it says the it's true it says that for linear output it can approximate any continuous function which but it's actually true for other kind of activation function like sigmoid or the tan h so so the thing is when we had a, a neural network model that means we have the set of inputs lying here and then we develop some high level uh, feature out of those inputs more complex feature out of those thing and finally out of those complex feature we try to predict the final output <coughs> now now let us let us so so the actual functionality of a neural network model can be represented in this way so we have an output and we can say that <coughs> we map the input x into an output y by transforming through these two parameters so what does theta and w is the parameter so we basically <coughs> theta and w basically denotes this whole internal zone that we determine and here what we say that <coughs> uh, in the last layer we call this is the w parameter and on this hidden layer we call this is my theta parameter so effectively if i say in that manner that this portion the this set of hidden layers parameters have been represented by theta and in the final output layer we represent the parameters as w then we can rewrite the stuff in this manner <coughs> we can rewrite the stuff in this manner so it will be some transformation from x and using theta followed by some linear combinations of with the w so now the thing is that if we treat this as my input for the for my final layer then this basically represents some high level feature that the system has learned during its training period and once those feature are learned then we can actually predict the final outcome by doing some linear combinations on those features so typically this phi or the feature is very complex and uh, it's very very difficult to identify those feature uh, through handcrafted mechanism <coughs> so so what we sometimes say that this representation of my data is parameterized as 
this five star <coughs> and we need to determine this theta function. So in order to find this theta, uh, we need to solve some optimization problem. <coughs> so when we try to determine this phi, it's actually a complex and phi can be generic as well. So identifying those feature is difficult but if we have some prior knowledge about the problem then we can actually encode the prior knowledge into this function through some mechanism. <coughs> so now let us look into how we can design a feed forward network. So when we try to design a feed forward network or when we try to develop a neural network of this form then <coughs> we need to determine few of the stuff so what kind of activation function do i need to use <coughs> i need to decide about the architecture how many number of layers and how many number of units in each layer that will be present i need to decide what the output units as well i when i try to determine this w parameters so i need to optimize something so i need to have some cost function <coughs> and when i have this cost function i try to determine this w parameters as an iterative way so if i choose a wrong set of w parameters then i can I should expect a very high cost value for that W parameter. So I <coughs> and I uh, update my W values in such a way that my uh, uh, the cost function is reduced to very small value or it's the minimum that I can have. So in order to find out the best W parameters we need to use the gradients of the cost function with respect to the different parameters. So how we can find out the gradients and uh, that is one of the important thing that we need to take care of. And also the way we want to uh, optimize our system that is also very important what kind of optimizer we are going to use. So now so till now we have seen the activation function uh, different activation function so there is no hard and fast rule that you have to use a particular kind of um, activation function the primary idea is to start with the rectified li uh, linear unit as an initial choice and the number of players and the number of units you can start with any number and then you have to iterate over which is actually a good fit for you the output unit that we need to choose it depends on few of the other stuff <coughs> so uh, so the cost function will be related with the output function that we are having because if it's a regression kind of output then we can measure the euclidean distance between the predicted value and the actual value and we based on that difference we can uh, take the necessary action but if it's a problem of classification then we cannot measure the euclidean distance so which is not a good measure so in that scenario we go to a methodology called cross entropy between the data and the model distribution <coughs> and and typically uh, uh, <coughs> any kind uh, the output units is mostly uh, decided uh, by these three types of units so one it can be the linear unit so whatever we are getting we are predicting as my output so so we have determined some internal values each some at a, at a intermediate step or maybe we can say that we have determined some high level feature h and we determine the output 
to some linear combination <coughs> and when we have a kind of a classification problem what we try to do that we want to specify the probability that what is the probability of y given that it's an x so <coughs> so which can be actually represented as a probability distribution something like this and in order to uh, uh, maximize this probability or uh, we can say the or mm, uh, what we try to do is we want to maximize the log likelihood and this can be shown that when we try to maximize this log likelihood which is actually effectively mean the minimizing the mean square error that we have seen for the similar to the linear regression so that is with uh, respect to linear units output units can be also a sigmoid units uh, and this is typically used when we have a classification problem so effectively we want to have a probability something like this that what is the probability of y is 1 given that it's an x and it's typically it's used for binary classification when my uh, there are uh, there exists only two class either 0 or 1 so if i know the probability for uh, probability for y being 1 then i can also determine the probability for what is the probability of y to become 0 and for the given x and i will choose the maximum one as the final classification now there will be some issue if i choose uh, uh, choose a linear unit instead of a sigmoid unit in order to describe my uh, uh, the classification so if so if i have a linear unit then i have to restrict this uh, uh, output between 0 and 1 because it's a two class classification and i i will have a very complex expression to uh, specify that stuff and when i need to determine the gradient of this kind of expression it will be also a very tedious job <coughs> and if we can define it through a probability then if my error is zero or sorry if my error is high or my probability uh, of predicting is high <coughs> on er error the uh, error value is high when i'm predicting it wrongly then i should have a strong gradient so that i can modify or modify my w parameter in a more meaningful manner so that is the uh, expectation that is the expected thing that should happen for a good output unit or when we are trying to predict with the probability now so binary classification has this uh, stuff so i can predict only two classes but when i go for multi-class classification the similar concept has been extended and it's uh, it's called the soft max so it's similar to the sigmoid one only difference is that for whatever value i get uh, for each of the classes i do an exponentiation of that stuff <coughs> and i sum sum all those exponential values so so this basically says the probability of a given input falls into the class one this is probability of the given input falls into class two and so on and among those values i will choose the maximum one and all of the, these values can be shown to be one and it sums up to be one so effectively i can say that it represent the probability so class having the highest probability will be the predicted output class <coughs> And there are few advantages of this stuff. So when we try to maximize the log likelihood, so if we take the log 
of this expression we get an expression something like this <coughs> so if you look into this expression then if i have a correct um, prediction that means if the class let's say it's a it falls into second class uh, or, or the class 2 and uh, I predict it correctly so therefore this value will have the highest probability so if it predicts this correctly so effectively this value will be close to 0 because this expression <coughs> will be so this log and exponential gets nullified in uh, this operation so effectively I will have this value to be 0 or this value to be close to 0 but if I have a wrong prediction then this value will be actually high that you can actually show mathematically that if I have a wrong prediction then this value and this value will be different and also this expression has a advantage that it's invariant to uh, addition of some scalar stuff <coughs> now in order to uh, design the actual architecture <coughs> so it's a chain based architecture and so what are a so few of the things you need to decide so how many number of layers you should have the number of units uh, in each layer and what will be the connectivity of those units so we have already known that single hidden layer is sufficient to feed the training data but we do not know how many number of neurons will be required in that stuff but the issue is that if we have a single hidden layer it may not perform well <coughs> and it it has been observed that in, in most of the time the deeper networks are preferred because it requires fewer number of units so if you have fewer number of units then it, it will require fewer number of parameters but the problem is that when we have this kind of scenario we'll have more nonlinearity into the system and it may be a difficult to optimize but still this is actually preferred for the computation purpose now when we try to say, uh, talk about this cost function so let us take this scenario that we have an uh, example in we have let's say we have been m number of examples uh, for which we want to validate the model so if I try to validate that mm, stuff so we call those example as the example in the test set so we have not seen this test set while developing our model so the expected thing is that or the expected thing out of my model is that my model should predict this uh, test set accurately so when we say uh, prediction is accurate that means the Euclidean distance between the prediction and the golden value should be as small as possible and if you have an example we determine this thing with mean square error <coughs> Now the issue is that we need to develop a model and we need to determine we need to minimize this value. So when we try to minimize this value and we have not seen the, those values. So it's a problematic scenario that we are trying to minimize the value for certain examples which we have not seen at all. So therefore it's not possible so therefore what we do instead of reducing the mean square error for the test set we try to minimize the mean square error for the training set because 
we have this value known to us the uh, x values and the corresponding y values so the objective is that from the training set we will try to create a model and we will try to minimize the error in this environment and we hope that if we can minimize the error in this environment that will also minimize my test error so the so the whole so this idea actually depends on the philosophy that the examples that i am that i have drawn for my test set will be drawn from the same distribution from which this training data has been also observed so if i take my training data from one distribution and if i have the test data from other distribution then i cannot expect that this uh, mean square error for the test set will be minimum when i minimize this one so if this set of data both from the test set and the training set are drawn from the similar distribution or uh, identical independent and identically distributed uh, um, distrib distributed stuff then i can expect that uh, if i minimize my training uh, error then the test error will also be minimized <coughs> now let us take a look uh, uh, what does the um, mean square error actually mean so let's say um, mm, I have this set of points that have been drawn from some square term so the square uh, function now if I try to fit some data uh, if I try to fit some function then mm -hmm, <coughs> I need to draw some curve let's say I have a linear curve for the time being that passes through the origin so the mean square error will be the perpendicular distance from the point to this line so all these values will get added to all these values will be added and that will determine the <coughs> mean square error so if I choose this line then I will have some MAC so if for this line let's say I have MAC as M1 if I choose another line let's say this line then I will have another mean square error let's say it's M2 if I choose another line maybe sorry very bad but let's say this is a another straight line that I'm choosing that pass through the origin then effectively I will have another mean square error value <coughs> so now the thing is uh, among this mean square error I need to choose those line for which uh, this mi value capital mi value is the minimum now the interesting thing is that let's say if i choose a line that passes through let's say x axis and if i start rotating this line in this direction <coughs> then i can expect that when my line is follows the x axis it will have a very high gradient sorry it will have a very high mean square error and the moment i start rotating it my gradient will be small gradually gradient will reduce and once i cross this stuff and i once i go on this part again the mean square error will start increasing <coughs> so if i sweep this line then i will have a high value at this point lower value lower value lower value and then after a certain point of time it will start increasing so effectively if i plot the mean square error value with respect to the weight 
uh, parameters so here we are trying to fit a line something like w times x so i have only a single parameter to determine because it passes through the origin so we have assumed the bias to be zero so effectively i will get um, uh, mean square error follower curve something like this and definitely this point will be our interest because this is the minimum stuff that we can actually achieve so how we can actually determine this w so so out of this mean square error value uh, i uh, i need to choose this w value so that it becomes the minimum so one of the objective is that let's say i start with some w value which i don't know initially i guess some w value initially and from this initial w we get to know what is the mean square error at that position <coughs> now i will try to observe the gradient of the mean square error function at this point now so the gradient is actually increasing in this direction so effectively i will try to move i will try to move in a direction where the gradient actually decreases so if i choose a point here then the gradient is increasing in this direction and gradient is decreasing on the other direction so if i move on this direction my uh, gradient will be decreasing why i am choosing this direction because if i can reach here my gradient will be zero and that is the uh, gradient will be zero so i can know that that is a kind of a maxima or minima for our problem it will be a minima so effectively we try to reach to a position where my gradient is zero because that represents some maxima or minima so so if the gradient is increasing in this direction i take a jump on a reverse direction and i keep on moving uh, on the <coughs> on this uh, uh, on the I keep on moving on this direction and finally i reach to this point by looking into the gradient so let us take an very simple example so this is some <coughs> mean square curve and we have chosen a particular point on this curve and we observe the gradient is this <coughs> so we take a jump which is equivalent to the gradient value and we move to a position here now the gradient at this point and the gradient at this point will be different and let's say the gradient at this point we observe something like this value so i will take a jump again on the reverse direction because the gradient is increasing in this way we take a reverse jump and we proceed in the same manner so so if we keep on doing so then at some point of time we will reach to the bottom most portion of this curve so effectively if you see these gradient values it keeps on decreasing and when my gradient is close to zero then we can say that we have reached to some minima point and uh, we can choose the corresponding w value as the final w parameter for my curve fit <coughs> so so this is an example with a single variable so if we have a if we have multiple uh, parameters we can extend the same concept uh, to find out those w parameter so we will have some function involving these w parameters we can determine the mean square error and our target is to minimize this value so this is the mean square error and our target is to minimize this so the approach is the same so 
we start with some w1 and w2 parameter and we keep modifying w1 w2 so that this value actually reduces because when we are choosing uh, when we have this w we are choosing our w value such that the act, uh, actual value is decreasing so in a similar manner we can actually proceed and the way we update the w is as follows so we find out the gradient here with respect to a uh, particular w parameter so we have we have to take the partial derivative here because this j function depends on more than one w parameter so effectively we determine the gradient and we deduct that gradient from the original w parameter and we update with this uh, we take this new wj as the new parameter and we continue to do so till it basically converges to the uh, same value which is effectively means that i have a uh, partial derivative is as zero because if this derivative is zero then wj will converge and uh, in many times instead of um, taking a very big jump which is equivalent to the <coughs> derivative we try to have a learning rate and we multiply with learning rate so it basically means instead of taking the full jump proportional to the gradient we take a smaller jump not the full jump as uh, as has been determined by the actual gradient so this is a vector notation that we can actually express <coughs> now so this is with respect to when we have this mac and we know how to uh, update the w parameter now when we have the neural network so it will be a set of layers uh, and in each layer there will be several number of neurons and at the output stage we will have the final MAC value <coughs> so so the thing is if we if we start with a set of inputs if we start with a set of inputs and if we propagate those values over the neural network let's say I have a big neural network here and finally I have some output layer at this point of time <coughs> so I feed this input and I get my output so I provide some input I get my output and by looking at the output I can determine the MAC value now our objective is that that by looking into this MAC at this point this point we need to update the value of those w's on this neural network so it will be a big network maybe more than one number of layers so you have to propagate this gradient into this network and finally i have to update all of those w values that are there so 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 the way neural network works is as follows we have the inputs <coughs> we propagate the values through the neural network and we get the output we determine the cost function and based on this outcome of the cost function we try to adjust the w parameter so it follows two steps so one is the forward propagation where we propagate the input to the output and then we go for a back propagation of the stuff based on the mm -hmm. based on the value of this MAC and we try to modify the W parameter <coughs> so how this back propagation works uh, we will see but in order to apply this back propagation algorithm back propagation stuff or the gradient that we decide at the output that gradient has to be translated to all these intermediate 
stage. So in order to tra transform that gradient information to the intermediate node, we use the simple rule of calculus or the chain rule of calculus. So if I need to determine a derivative something like uh, dz over dx, then I can represent this uh, as a uh, using the chain rule that I find out the derivative of z with respect to y and then followed by y with respect to x. So this is for the scenario when I have this kind of situation that <coughs> y is a function of x and this uh, and z is a function of this gx or effectively it's a function of y. <coughs> so, sorry. So, 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 so if I need to determine uh, the derivative of z with respect to x then I can actually apply this chain rule and if I have more than one variable then I have to take the partial derivative and I need to have the Jacobian stuff. So this is with a vector notation. So let us look the basic idea of back propagations. So, uh, so let's say we have some input and we will have certain weights through which we can, uh, we do the linear combinations of this input. So we get the deactivation function and we apply some activation function, we get the output. Now when we have the output, we can actually determine the loss function and the cost function because we have the target level and we observe what is the output. Now once we have this loss function, we can actually determine the derivative of this uh, loss with respect to the out. Now when I try so the whole goal is that by looking into this loss function, I have to modify my W parameters because how this W affects this loss function that we have to determine. Now there are many intermediate nonlinear functionality. So determining this uh, effect with respect to W1 is difficult. Therefore we are using the chain rule. So, so the thing is, once we determine this L, we find out how L is varying with respect to out. And so that we can figure it out because uh, we know the loss function. And once we have this derivative, we can actually determine how this out is varying with respect to the uh, pre-activation output. So this, uh, uh, derivative of out with respect to a is nothing but it's the g prime so how this two are related similarly once we have this active once we have this activation we can actually easily find out how a is varying with respect to w1 so effectively if i need to find out how a is varying with respect to w1 we can determine by the chain rule is as follows. And once we have this derivative, we can update this W1 parameter <laughs> the way we did it for the gradient descent. <coughs> now, so if, I, if we can proceed in this manner, we'll be able to determine all the W parameters and we continue to do so till my loss function is minimized. Now there are there can be some issue you may face with this approach. Uh, so let us look into this stuff. Let's say we take the same set of points and we try to fit a curve. So let's say we fit a curve oh, whose degree uh, is one so it will be curved something like this <coughs> now we know that there will be high mean square error value because these values will be too big 
Now if I try to fit with degree 2, it will be more closer. If I try to fit degree 3, it will be more closer. <coughs> if I f go ahead with 4, it's, it's, uh, it tries to fit in more accurately. But since we have drawn the points from the square curve, so probably it will fail to generalize. Similarly, if we go ahead with higher order degree polynomial to fit this one, then we have a very uh, bad scenario. So they will fit very accurately with this set of points, but it will fail to generalize because we have drawn this set of points from a uh, square curve. So effectively some point will lie here, some point will lie here, some point will lie here. So the error value with respect to this will be very high when I go for higher order polynomial. So the, so the thing is when we try to determine or we try to fit a model, so it can happen I have a very good fit in the training but a very high error on the test data and I can have a situation <coughs> in this case that uh, I have always a very high value of error. <coughs> so these two scenarios are not uh, expected. So. Um, um, uh, not expected so we have two primary scenario that we need to take care of one is the underfitting so where model is not able to obtain sufficiently low error value because the error value will be always very high and the other scenario is the overfitting when I have the error value very large <coughs> uh, uh, for the test set but the training set the error value is very small so it effectively remembers all the training data and then it tries to predict so uh, so that is called the overfitting so we need to overcome these two scenario by choosing the appropriate set of uh, parameters stuff so this is just an example of the underfitting that we have talked about and this is a case of overfitting because it it will definitely fail to generalize the stuff and probably this will be the best fit uh, that we can have <coughs> now when we try to find out the best value for our error then we need to know a few of the terms or a few other things we need to take care of so 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 the thing is when we have this uh, higher order model then we can express more number of function because when we have this model we are trying to fit the best model and when we have a higher order model we have a lot of number of models out of which I can choose so I have the high degree of freedom from where I can choose my function or I can say it has a better capacity and when I have this scenario I my model is very much limited so I don't have much choice over the function so 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 if I have a very high capacity, I can have a certain observation. If I have a very low capacity in my model, I can have a different observation. So typically what has been what we observe is that if I have a very high capacity, then my training error goes to zero gradually <coughs> and the generalization error or, or the test error that we can actually observe it will go down for some time and after that it will start increasing so when we have so so the thing is that there will be an optimal point which is be the most sought after point that we try to figure it out and 
on this optimal capacity line if if i choose a model based on this point then it will basically underfit my model and if i choose a model somewhere lying here where my generalization gap is too high we call it in a overfitting zone so there is a nice theorem uh, uh, which is called the no free lunch so what does it says so average over all possible data generating distribution every classification algorithm has the same error rate when classifying unseen points so which is effectively means that no machine learning algorithm is universally any better than any other so for a certain set of points i may observe uh, good results from one of the algorithm maybe for certain other set of points some other algorithm will work the best for me so so the problem that we have talked about is the uh, mm, so overfitting and the underfitting so underfitting is uh, understandable very easily that we have a very limited capacity so we have to uh, increase the capacity but the increasing in capacity creates a problem or it it goes into in the overfitting zone now in order to overcome this overfitting scenario there are a number of techniques we won't go into the details of those techniques but it lists out some of those methodology that uh, uh, through which you can actually uh, restrict some of the overfitting scenario so one of the most popular method is called the regularization so this method basically uh, adds a constraint that uh, the weight parameter should not be uh, very high value so typically uh, we try to sp specify our cost function as my mac and uh, along with that mac what we try to say that it will have some other component let's say uh, i would like to say that w parameter should be close to zero it should not be very high so if i specify my regularization parameter or the regularization weight in this way so this has some effect on the uh, so this mac is uh, controlled by the w parameter that i am choosing and along with that we also say that this w parameter should be very close to zero or it should not be very high because effectively we try to minimize this whole expression so so if i do that then my i can restrict some of the uh, overfitting scenario and there are other methods through which we can actually uh, we, we try to reduce the overfitting scenario so these are the methods we are we won't go into the details of that stuff so now i'll stop here and we'll continue with the uh, issues and challenges in, in iot how deep learning can actually help in that domain that we will see in the next lecture